The memes drive the narrative and the narrative drives the price. So every token is a meme coin? They're just high velocity memes that extract value from a community. That's why we built ThorChain on memes. JP Thor, an engineer, investor, and founder of ThorChain. A decentralized exchange, which is the largest liquidity protocol in the world with a market value of over $2 billion. What did you do before crypto? Well, I was in the Air Force flying fighters, bombers, flew around the world, and then I got into Bitcoin in 2013. How did you know that the meme gain was so important? Look, even back in 2017, meme coins were a thing. Coins that attach themselves to memes perform really well. You're building in public. What does that mean? Build in public, set the memes free. Our purpose is to upgrade humanity. If you're building in secret, you are trying to withhold useful information from humanity when that information should be free. What is Vultisi if you had to explain it to your mother? So you log into your Gmail, your bank account with multi-factor. So you should be able to log into your crypto wallet with a two-factor. Vultisi is just a safe wallet that's multi-factor, but it's on-chain two-factor. So you basically need two devices to sign a transaction. How important is money to you? Money is an interim parking position for time and effort. It's more meaningful to me to build a product that meaningfully upgrades humanity than to sit on the back of a yacht with a private jet and a helicopter and do nothing. That's meaningless to me. If you miss your 18 years old self today, what would you tell him? 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer two with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable, network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. So, couple of days in Singapore? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was here on Monday and then I fly out Saturday morning to Brussels yeah. to go to FCC. Melbourne for the weekend, and then uh, Singapore, Vietnam, US. Yeah. What a life. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get going, stuff done. Going, exactly. <laughs> going <laughs> to all these places on Earth to ultimately go to the moon, right? That's yeah. the idea. <laughs> Earth first, everywhere, then moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not just the moon, space, universe, brother. Exactly. Next galaxy. We'll talk about that, actually. Yeah. Multiplanetary <laughs> colonization. One of the things that you love. Yeah, 100%. We absolutely need to do it. Welcome to the podcast, JP. I'm um, so good to be here. How are you doing? Good, brother. No, this is it. You just told me it's going to be two hours, so let's just go. Let's just go. <laughs> I mean, we're going to run out of things to talk about because I talk about one for five X. Some people think I talk about two X. <laughs> <laughs> so if people, people who used to do two X, they're going to be basically watching that at four X, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. No, honestly, you should listen to everything at two X. Listen to podcasts at two X. Watch YouTube videos at two X. Your brain can catch up. You can start at one X, then one point two five X, one point five X. Just go straight to two X. Your brain will be like warp mode, and then you're good to go. When you get, it's all about ingesting information faster. And so I typically like listen to things at 2X or watch YouTube at 2X. And then I have another screen. I put it in picture in picture and I'm on Twitter and whatever. Just maximum, maximum output, maximum input. When did you start thinking that way? Look, it's, yeah, it's a good question. I, I've always done things fast. Um, a case in point, when I was, on, when I was at the academy, uh, at the Air Force Academy, we got trained to disassemble the weapon and reassemble it as quickly as possible. And I won out of 300 people in my year the fastest weapon disassembly and reassembly. And I don't call myself a, have a really good hand-eye coordination, but I just had a, had a flow where I could rip the weapon apart and reassemble it faster than anyone else. Oh. Actually, another, uh, another th uh, thing I buried away is when I was eight, my dad taught me how to drive. I was part of one of 10 kids. Mm. We all learned how to drive. And I would always race around in the car in the Hilux, uh, race around the block, and he'd be like, always yell at me, you, go, you drive too fast, drive too fast, you're going to be a supercar driver or whatever. But uh, yeah, I always just think fast, do fast, talk fast. Just be fast. Accelerate, which is now so, my thing. So you, <laughs> so you had that already in your childhood, teenagehood? Yeah, I've always just been fast. People think that uh, you're fast, you make mistakes, you know, go slow, go good. Or well, slow is good, good is fast. And But I just think the faster you do things, just get to the point, just get it out, just move. I hate stagnation. How did you manage uh, the education system then? Because in the classroom, right, you have, let's say, 25 students, but it's always going at the pace of the... I was homeschooled. So I was the only person oh. in my year. So there's 10 of us. My mum, basically, there's one girl and the nine boys, and I was number three. 
and we were taught maths. Well, she would she wouldn't teach us maths. She would give us well the early stages. We were taught maths, like mental maths, blah, blah blah. But when I got to like year year three, five, six, blah blah eight, she'll give us a math book and say, okay, you know you're learning year three maths. And my elder brother's on year four book, and my elder sister was on the year five book. And I was like, well, what happens after I do year three? Because I want to get to year four. And so you just I would quickly learn out. You just have to eat the math book and just smash through it. And quicker you got through the math book, then you'd get the next next one for the next year. And then I realized, and I was like, what happens after year 12? Well, you go to university. So, you know, just scream through it. So I was like, yeah, homeschooled. I could just accelerate away as fast as I can. Do, did you ask your parents why the decision of homeschooling versus? Well, there was 10 of us and we were living rural. And my mum was a formerly a governess. And my dad was a math teacher at the, lo at the uh, local high school in town. And uh, 10 of us, both my mum was an English teacher or a governess. My dad was a math teacher. So they thought... We're not going to send our kids away to a school and lose control of what they're learning. We'll just teach them ourselves. So you say you're talking about acceleration. You call yourself chief energy officer, right? And ma master of chaos. Who are you? <laughs> so, no, that's it. The meme lord. No, it's, it's, it's master of chaos. It's, it's, uh, well, I, I like to create memes and create ideas that are new and are counterintuitive. So, like people were thinking it's like chief executive officer. It's just a lame term. So I kind of rebranded that to chief energy officer because that's actually the purpose of a chief executive officer. Yeah. You have, as a CEO, chief energy officer, you have to be the most charismatic, most energetic, the one that most align with what you're building. Like everyone in your company or your project or your vision should look to you for that energetic activation. You are the biggest, most hardcore believer. So the CEO, chief energy officer, should just should be the person most invested in what they're building, the the biggest advocate of what they're building. And so for that, I was attached myself to ThoughtChain. And ThoughtChain doesn't have a CEO in it, like an executive team. It's it's a decentralized protocol. Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to play a pun there that I'm actually the chief energy officer of the community, of the of of the ecosystem to push forward. What's really interesting is I'm 32 now. I started my first company when I was 23 in London. And it's a data analytics company. And actually, I did the same. CEO, I wrote him on my business card, chief energy officer. Really? And people what were like, this? people were like, what the fuck? Like they were laughing at me, right? Because like, you're 23 years old and you don't even kind of know what a CEO is. I mean, first, are you really a CEO of like a two or three people company? No, but like I wrote chief energy officer and I was proudly going to people with my chief energy officer card. And then I just switched after like, six months or a year because I was, uh, it was the corporate world, right? So I was completely misunderstood. I was like, that's not working, right? But it's, when, when I saw your thing, I was like, fuck man, someone who understands me. <laughs> yeah. Or I understand you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, 100%. I, I mean, chief eco ecosystem, chief energy. Like <laughs> always try and be counter normal. And, you know, the, the world is full of people who, 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 there's a vast majority who just think the same. And if you just think the same, then you're just going to be dragged along by, you know, by the waves of humanity. But if you, you should try to be counter, counter normal. So I call myself extremely counter normal, tolerant of chaos, right? I'm, create, be a signal in the noise. So you don't need to follow, you should lead. And you don't need to lead, you should be the leader of yourself and the leader of your ideas. Where do you think this comes from? Interesting. Uh, I guess not having been homeschooled and, and then I was out and basically I was allowed to form my own opinion of what the, the world was. And well, I had a very naive opinion of the world. You know, the world to me was what I read in Encyclopedia Britannica. And so I'd, I'd read it because we had, I wasn't exposed much to the world when I was from zero to like 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, you know, we would quite insulate. It was just us being homeschooled, learning math, English, and Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm. And so my understanding of what the world was, was just this fantasy in, in, the, in, in the encyclopedia. And it was just based on fact. And there was not much opinion. It was just what I read. So I thought the world was a very fact-oriented place and you could dissect it. Once you read the encyclopedia, you understood the world. Mm. So I approach, I approach everything as just, where are the facts? What, what, what's the underpinning here? And uh, so that's first principles thinking. Mm. And so that naive understanding that you could just approach the world as a giant encyclopedia that you could read and understand carries on. And, and so I look at problems in that way, yeah. Was the moment you realize most of the things were being told actually not working or not really true or can be disrupted or can be improved? Yeah, well, I guess I realized as I, I w went to university and then I was, I was trying to be a pilot, a fighter pilot, which is very fact oriented. You either knew it or you didn't. And, and I was so focused on doing that. I kind of let the whole world go past. I wasn't really involved in social, the kind of like social 
circles that you kind of get swept up in and whatnot because I was there for a mission. I wanted to be a pilot, fighter pilot, test pilot, astronaut because that was my astronaut. Na- yeah, my naive, naive understanding, which actually, <laughs> interesting, that made me more confident. You know, the, there's a saying go like there's like a bell curve. If you know, don't know much, you're very confident. If you know the mid-range, like you lose confidence. And if you know a lot, you get back to being confident again, mm. right? And so like the bell curve is like a giant, a giant chasm to cross between naive actually gives you confidence because you don't know that too much. In, and then you learn a bit and you're like, you get intimidated and you're like, I don't know enough, right? And you had to cross the chasm to, to knowing a lot to give you back the confidence again. So that took a while. So being naive allowed me to be really confident and have high conviction, right? <laughs> so just Absolutely. To, and then allowed me to like cross the chaos, the, yeah. the chasm. It's so relevant to, I mean, pretty much every aspect of life, but crypto also, right? When you're in crypto, you think, oh man, this shit is easy because you're naive. And then you're doing amazingly well. Then probably you get wrecked. And then you understand you're kind of like more mid curving. And then probably if you stick in, yeah, 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 yeah. if you stick in uh, yeah. and stay there, hopefully like you get more, let's say l- less naive and, and, and more, uh, more strategic. Okay. Yeah. And as you peel back, you know, the forest clears, the fog clears and the, you can see more of the trees, you can peel back the layers and you can try and understand and build a strategy. Uh, yeah, so it's an inter- interesting perspective. You said um, I was on a mission. I wanted to become an astronaut, right? Yeah. What's your mission now? Yeah, it's fascinating. So I, I, I just wanted to always explore. I wanted to explore the world and then explore space and then the universe. And I remember reading this book, this foldout from, was, I think it was a Nat Geo magazine. Cause we had like, we had a Nat Geo subscription at home. Um, and so I'd love reading the Nat Geo books. And Nat Geo is once again, like very fact-based. We used to be very fact-based. Uh, and there was this expose in the universe and like you kept zooming out. There's earth and then the galaxy, like you can see the solar system and then output the Milky Way. And then, then all the galaxies in the universe. And I realized that the universe is such an incredibly deep space that we just don't understand. And so I thought, I really wanted to explore it. And I knew that I was very naive, like, you know, perhaps I could only like orbit the earth and the space station or whatever, but I wanted to like, to be part of that. I wanted to go next level, but to be an astronaut, they only slept from a pool of test pilots and a test pilot really only slept from a pool of hardcore fighter pilots with engineering backgrounds. And to only really be a fighter pilot with engineering background, you had to go through very specific training, uh, start with engineering, switch to pilot, fighter pilot and go through that. So I started that. I, I left school, uh, Stay back to the next year, to year 12, because I was too young. Joined the Air Force when I was 16, which was, I was the youngest person in my class mm-hmm. um, just to start. And I wanted to go for it. And then when I got to like fighter pilot region, uh, I'd done my engineering degree. I got to fight, fighter stream. I was getting onto operational conversion. Then I basically got dragged sideways because I was too crazy for the organization. I was too intense. I was a brilliant pilot. I aced all my, my flying and, you know, I never, never had any issues, but they, they found me so adventurous. I would always like press buttons on the jet and fire at the radar and do this and pull crazy maneuvers and, and push, push, push. Because I, for me, I was trying to learn the jet myself. I was te- trying to teach myself. So when I was flying around, like, the second I get bored, I'll touch buttons and, and slew the radar over there and like move things around. And they, they would always watch my tapes and be like, what are you doing? Like, don't touch that. You haven't been taught how to do that. And I'm like, I'll just, anyway. So I got, I got massive disillusion with the organization because I realized, they didn't actually want smart people. Mm. They wanted uh, pawns. They just wanted robots. Yeah. And I'm not a robot. And I, I viewed myself as very creative. And I remember telling my commanding officer at the time, like, I'm in a, I'm a high agency, high output, highly creative individual that wants to, to keep flying and move forward. And I'm like, you just don't appreciate me. I remember saying that. Like, you just don't appreciate my talent here. Why are you trying to move me sideways and, like, suppress my talents? Let, let me free. And they obviously didn't like that. And I didn't like them back. So, see ya. That's the pure entrepreneur mindset, right? I feel misunderstood. I have some ego, right? But like, I also understand that there are a lot of um, kind of organizations or systems or politics that are not beneficiary to the world, right? It, it doesn't make things move. And I feel so at discomfort that I need to improve something. Right. Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. You, you, you see a problem and you want to fix it and you, you, you take the risk and you have the conviction to actually jump in and, and be the, be the person to make that change. You, you need courage. So you talk about, uh, obviously discovering the space, but, um, one of the first thing you've done is discovering the earth. You bought a helicopter. 
and fly the word. <laughs> Why? <laughs> no, so I finished the, I've been in crypto since 2013. So uh, like it's each cycle, you log your wealth up. You know, your first cycle, you might start with 10 grand. Uh, and like then in 2017, I was sitting on like, you know, I think five to 10 million. And then in the 2021 cycle, that's another log up. So I was sitting on like 700 million. And then, uh, and, and then I always knew like each cycle, if you, if you stay in your build, you're going to 10x. So, you know, uh, like, but you anyway, know, so I accumulated all this wealth and I took some time off and I thought, uh, what, and I always love exploring. So I drove my, my, I acquired a Tesla in like 2019, 2020. I drove that around Australia. I always love exploring Australia and being the FSO, been all over the world exploring, but I wanted to take the next level. And I wanted to, so I purchased a helicopter cause I, I love flying. And Airbus, I bought it off, said, hey, we're going to deliver it to you in Brisbane or, or Melbourne or whatever. And I'm like, hang on, isn't it being made in like France, England, uh, Ox, uh, like whatever? I'm like, I'll pick it up and fly it home. And they were like, what? I'm like, yeah, I'll pick it. I'll let you pick up your factory and fly it home. Like, why are you putting it in a ship? Because it's going to take like six weeks in the ship or whatever, back of a ship. And they're like, look, if you honestly want to do it, we're not going to stop you. So, And at the time, I was reading Dick Smith's book. And Dick Smith flew his helicopter around the world. So I'm like, man, if Dick Smith can do it, I can do it. And I pulled up the roster to Google around. Not many people have done it, flying helicopters around the world to that extent. There's been a couple of notable trips, but I thought, hey, all these guys can do it. I'm, I'm going to do it. There's probably like five or six people who have done it. So, yeah, I picked up the helicopter, flew it from England to Australia, took about six weeks, got locked up in Myanmar for 24 hours, had to escape. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you how that soon. But uh, like it's, it's all – I wanted the challenge because it's how do you fly a helicopter from England to Australia? It's just a lot of little problems to solve every single day. And I love pro solving problems. And I'm not scared of jumping in the arena. So literally it was, that, it was that. And here's the thing, you can't plan really well from England to Australia helicopter because just so many things change. And so I, I also don't like planning. I just think you should just rock up. You should know enough and you should have enough a little plan to not marry your plan. But I mean, planning makes you inflexible. I prefer to be super flexible and plan as we go. Mm -hmm. But you know, so I flew at home and it was, it was a good one. As an engineer, what are your thoughts on a helicopter or even a plane being able to take off, fly thousands of kilometers with hundreds of people aboard and land safely? Look, the, the, honestly, the miracle of flight is only 100 years old or just a little bit over 100 years old uh, when the, the Wright brothers took, took to the skies in uh, 1904 from memory. Um, so it's 120 years right, of flight. We completely take that for granted, mm -hmm. and uh, which is wild because you jump on a flight today and all you see is like TSA and air hosties and the back of the, the seat and, you know, you look out and you're like, yeah, whatever, where's the movie, where's my next meal? But, man, you were at flight level 350, flight level 360 in an aluminium tube composites flying at like almost 1,000 k's an hour. Crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Right, come on. <laughs> yes. And it's so safe, right? As well, it's so safe. And people go, oh, you fly a helicopter, that must be so dangerous. I'm like, hang on a minute. Flying in a helicopter is much safer than even stepping out into that road and, and walking down the street here in Singapore or whatever. Or like just me in the grab car here is more dangerous than me flying my helicopter. How about uh, versus flying a plane? Oh, no, well, planes are even more safer for a factor of 10. Yeah, well, we're not talking general aviation here. There's like specific parts of aviation. So an airliner, fly, like flying in an airliner is the most safest, one of the most safest things you can do, believe it or not. It's just so safe. We've made it so safe. What does that say about the potential of humans? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes to show you that uh, we can take our understanding of the universe, science, technology, which is just basically memes, by the way, we're going to talk about a lot of memes in this podcast. Of course memes we will. And genes. <laughs> of course so, we will. Like, it's all just memetic information and we're able to turn into something that gives us agency, right? To, to fly around the world. Like your ancestors, even zoom back 200 years, to fly from Singapore to Melbourne, you couldn't do it. So what's the difference between like 150 years ago or even 100 years ago, even like 60 years ago, you couldn't fly from Singapore to Melbourne. But now I can jump on Emirates 777 mm. or an A380 and I can be in, in Melbourne in six, seven hours. That's just crazy. So what's it's the memetic information now, understanding the universe has vastly improved through just hardcore engineering, hardcore thinking, intelligence on a giant aggregate of information that we build upon, right? Mm. 
So it's wild. How long until we can do Singapore, New York in two hours? Huh. Do you need to? I mean, to spend a weekend. Maybe you should just teleport your senses there. I was thinking about teleportation, obviously, but that's like a next level thing that is really hard to compare on how it would work, right? No, it's but easy. It's going to happen in the next five, 10 years. Teleportation. Of your agency. What does that mean? There will be a Tesla bot or a figure bot or some human I bought walk around New York that you can teleport your full sensory delegation to. So it will walk around New York, talk. It will talk like you, walk like you. Delegate all its senses by styling back to you. You'll be wearing a, a AR headset and you'll walk your bot into a restaurant in New York and talk to your client or your boss. Done. Mm. But I mean, so that's when you teleport your agency and teleport your senses and teleport your output. So you don't, do you need to be in New York when you just literally connect via styling with a humanoid bot to, to express you in a physical manifestation in New York? In, the, in, not in just, a business context. In not two hours, but in like 200 milliseconds. <laughs> 20 milliseconds is the ping that Elon's trying to get on Starlink. Yeah. So yeah, And then, then you can teleport your agency to a, to a humanoid board in London in 20 milliseconds. So the question is, do you need to fly there? I guess it depends what you're looking for. If it's for a business meeting... Well, why don't you, so, if you just, so the evolution if you want is to like, experience the place, I mean, then all right. you might as well take a couple of weeks and it doesn't matter if it takes you six hours or so 12 what, hours what to go there. what do you get by being there in person? Uh, you, what are you trying to pursue by being in real life? You're trying to pursue higher bandwidth, lower latency. That's it. Hmm. So why didn't I just do this via Zoom, this, this podcast? What is the difference between me and you right now and me on a Zoom? Because you Higher can- bandwidth, lower latency right? High bandwidth. I can express more of my emotions. You can see the muscles on my face. You can see where I'm gesturing to you. And that's communicating far more than just my speech right now, right? You can see my energy levels. You can see my, my tone, my style. You can learn more about me. So it's a bandwidth problem. There's also a latency problem. So right now, the, as fast as you can see me move, you know, probably like five milliseconds through your eye and through your, your nerve into your brain, uh, that's the latency, so then if I jumped on Zoom, there's going to be 200 millisecond latency and a much lower bandwidth as I fit in a giant, uh, like a small screen. So you're just pursuing higher bandwidth, lower latency. So what if I'm able to solve those problems with a Starlink connection through that you know, 10 millisecond ping between here and New York? So you, anything below about 100 millis, 50 milliseconds is imperce- imperceptible, right? So it's, it's fast, almost as fast, right? Uh, so we're talking about it's going to be so fast, as in the latency will be so low that we don't need to be in person anymore, but now it becomes a bandwidth problem. So can I communicate way more than just speech? Can you see the, the, the muscles on my face move? Can you see the gestures? And so the humanoid bot that manifests me should, will eventually get to the point where I can express my bandwidth directly to you. Right, and way more than just a 2D screen can. Mm. It's a bandwidth latency problem. That's all it is. So we'll be able to record podcasts like that. Actually, the, I think it was Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Lex Friedman that did a test, right? Yep. On a podcast. It, it's happening, but then- I, I like the in real life. I like also the before and after, right? It makes a big difference on like how you build a connection and how you ultimately- But as I'm about to tell you, that's just interim as well. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want me to drop the word space brains at you know, 30 minutes into, into this podcast. I was hoping that'd be at the back to give, at least give you a list of something. To but I'll drop the word now, space brains, and we'll come back to it. Okay, fair enough. What did you do before crypto? Well, I was in the Air Force flying fighters, bombers, flew around the world. And then I got into Bitcoin in 2013, when about hundred bucks at the time. I was out of this tech pitch and someone was pitching Bitcoin exchange. I went home, I was like, what the heck's a Bitcoin exchange? And as soon as I read, I was like, this is epic. So I put like four grand straight into Bitcoin there. And then I had to like bounce around this kind of peer-to-peer market. I can't remember what it was called at the time. And then it pumped, went from hundred bucks to 800 bucks. And I was telling all my family, I got this email, which I've screenshotted and I share around. I was trying to sell my family on buying Bitcoin. I called it a once generation lifetime opportunity. Bitcoin's going to a million bucks. I was telling my family Bitcoin's going to a million bucks when it was 800 bucks back in 2013. How? Why? Well, I was explaining, this is a new financial system. It, it, it takes away trust. It, it's a, it solves the problem of a decentralized mint. It allows anyone to contribute to it. It allows anyone to participate. And this was when 
Bitcoin didn't even have, you couldn't even download an app off the app store. Apple had blanket bang, banned them all. So my next move was trying to create a Bitcoin wallet for the Apple app store, but they, they banned it all. So I remember downloading like the Windows EXE, uh, the, the Bitcoin um, core.exe file on my Windows laptop. And uh, that was my wallet at the time. And I was, I was trying to build it. Uh, and then wallet, self-custody. And then uh, I kept, kept my finger on the pulse and I watched Ethereum launch. Uh, I went to a hackathon. I won it, but it was like a decentralized app. I was a smart contract dev at the time. And I, uh, then after I won the hackathon, I got like a thousand bucks worth of ETH. I think it was like, I don't know, a dollar, $10 at the time. Hmm. Um, and then everyone's like, oh, let, let's build the, it was like the D app craze in 2016, 17 was like decentralized applications. And I just done this, this kind of factor, this kind of hackathon where everyone was, was thinking that in the Ethereum land, there was all dApps, D apps and DAOs, like DAOs. And I, uh, I remember at the time th- writing a whole bunch of white papers as people like, well, you won the hackathon, you're a smart contract developer now. I wasn't, I just literally done a couple lines of Solidity code. And uh, I remember writing a white paper on or various white papers. One was decentralized AI, I shared it around. One was a decentralized marketplace at the time. And there was a third one that was involving like drones or something. And I, I pitched it around, everyone, everyone thought the decentralized AI one was too crazy. And the decentralized drone one was also too crazy, which they were because like the hard neither hardware or AI in 2016, 17 was anywhere like today. And they just I decided to launch a decentralized marketplace. So basically like freelancer.com or whatever. And I think we raised about 10, I can't remember, it was probably like 5,000 ETH at the time in um, this ICO for this decentralized marketplace. Mm-hmm. But towards the end of this year, that year, I realized that nobody wanted, and we built this marketplace and we had like, a thousand providers and users, but I realized that nobody cared about paying each other in crypto and they had to pay each other tokens. They just want to pay each other in stable. By the way, stable coins didn't really exist back then. Mm. There was only, um, Omni, the Omni lay on Bitcoin on, on Tether and we couldn't work out how to get, there was DAI. Uh, DAI was just make a DAO, DAI. And so we tried to like rebuild, um, the marketplace in DAI and it was, it was a disaster. Uh, like no one was, no one cared. Um, so then I realized it was all a game of liquidity. People were on crypto to trade. Mm. And so that's when my next phase started. What did you do with the first marketplace? So we tried to build it and eventually I handed over to another team so I could focus fully on decentralized liquidity. And that team basically migrated that marketplace over several chains, Ethereum to Binance Smart Chain and, and beyond. Uh, and eventually we, uh, that team and I, we burnt out like 80% of the tokens and uh, the, the project still runs today and, the, it's called Kenya marketplace still barely, barely live running today. There's still a small treasury that the team run. Uh, but in the meantime, so handed that project over in 2018 and started building decentralized liquidity. Take me back to the beginning of Thor chain. Why did you launch Thor chain? Is it because you just realized, oh, people just want to trade or is it because you had a greater vision or uh, as you said before, I don't really plan. I plan as I kind of yeah, move so along, right? I, as we were, as I was building these, uh, this marketplace, right. And we were trying to get the token list. It was listed on Qcoin. Like the token went to like three, four hundred million million, this, this, um, this Kenya coin, right. And it pumped and dumped, but you know, we were tied up with centralized exchanges, you know, all the big centralized exchanges were like demanding like 300 grand listing fees, 600 grand listing fees. And you had to pay like market makers hundred grand a month to market make your token. So our treasury was just being blown up by, kind of set this centralized exchange Ponzi game where it just you literally just paid for liquidity and paid for your token to pump a dump. And everyone thought that was the thing. The thing that, and six months prior, I was involved in the Bancor launch and I invested mm. in the Kyber ICO in, in uh, September 2017 and also even the Airswap ICO mm. in, remember Airswap in like October? Yeah, I had the Samir Tabar like a year and a half yeah, ago when and I started the podcast. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was looking at these projects going, actually, no, these ones are going to deliver, mm. like Bancor Network Token, mm-hmm. delivering mm-hmm. on-chain liquidity. Kyber was in, was promising, like Kyber on-chain, like Kyber Network Crystal on-chain liquidity. Loved, I loved the vision of on-chain liquidity because I, I recognized that Central's exchanges were, oh, by the way, in 2014, I had my Bitcoin on empty Gox, Mt. Gox. Mm. And I could see some craziness happening. So I moved all my Bitcoin off empty Gox before the hack and I moved it to btc.com. And so empty Gox blew down in flames, it got hacked and I've narrowly avoided that. And, but my Bitcoin was being held on BTC 
I had a bit on my my Windows wallet and a bit on BTC because I was buying like Litecoin, Prime Coin, Feathercoin, Peercoin, all those crazy coins that you probably never heard of. This is like 2014 era coins, so I was any. And um, BTC got taken down by the FBI. Mm. So I woke up one day, logged into my exchange. It was just the FBI logo. Because because the hacker had was laundering all the 800,000 Bitcoin out of BTC, which is a Russian exchange, and the FBI, and I felt massively rugged. And that's when I declared war on a centralized exchange is because, yeah, just come on. Well, why are we using these decentralized MySQL databases to trade decentralized currencies? So that started me thinking uh, about decentralized liquidity. And so coming into 2017, 18, I realized nobody uh, was building it correctly. It was like, who was building Bitcoin to ETH swaps? I just wanted to swap ETH to Bitcoin. And, and Litecoin to Bitcoin, because that didn't exist. Mm. And at the time, you could only use like atomic swaps. And everyone was talking about atomic swaps, atomic swaps. And atomic swaps involve eight use, like steps between me signing something on a UTXO, you signing something else, co-mingling with mine, and we kind of like do this eight steps back and forward where we share like progressively uh, signed and unsigned UTXOs. And finally, we swap on the two different chains and I get my Litecoin, you get your Bitcoin. And I thought, nobody's going to use that. The, the user experience is just is mad. I thought, well, what is needed is a ability on-chain liquidity, a liquidity pool where you put in one asset and out pops the other. And, and the way I described to everyone is it's a fruit basket. And the fruit basket has one roll. Yeah, it's got a basket of 10 apples and 10 oranges. And if you put in an apple, the fruit basket will spit out oranges and you put in an orange, it'll spit out apples, right? Mm. And it's got 10 apples, 10 oranges, and you rock up and give it one apple, how many oranges will it spit out? And that was the way I thought about it. It was one divided by 10 plus one, one, one divided by 11, which is basically 0.91. Mm. So it will spit out 0.91 oranges because then the fruit basket can operate at any price curve. You could rock up with a billion apples and it will still give you some amount of oranges without going insolvent. So I, taking that fruit basket idea, we built it on chain, um, which is the basis of ThorChain. How did you become one of the projects with the most mind share in 2020, 2021, crypto cycle? Because you can build the right thing. There's a lot of people doing, probably building things that are decent, but that are never really known. Because there is a big difference between fundamentals and kind of narratives, right? And you manage that really well last cycle. We thought chain. Yeah, and the crazy How thing do you is, do that? Yeah, memes. Memes, brother, memes. So I built ThorChain on an anonymous identity. So my original first few projects I built publicly. And I realized that a true project, and I was forever married to this project, like it's very difficult to plan obsolescence to hand over a project if you build with a public identity. Like when do you ever get to hand it over? Right? You're forever married to it. So instead I thought, no, I need to build a project and do plan obsolescence, hand over to the community and then pop out myself. So I can create this persona and shed the persona and become myself rather than building the project under myself and trying to reimagine myself uh, after handing over the project. So the first couple of projects I did under my, my full identity, realized the problem there and built ThorChain under an anonymous identity called Lena. Mm. And Lena was the dev in the Discord. She was this kind of like 20, 21, 22 year old, Spanish looking junior dev. And she had a Telegram account, a Twitter account, which is ThorChain, and a Discord account called Lena156. And she ran the whole project. In fact, a lot of my team at first didn't even know who Lena was. I was, <laughs> built it. But I, and very, very, very start, I was consistent with the memes. This project had to build upon memes. And that's why I married it to Norse mythology. And, and there's a lot of memetic power in Last cycle ThorChain, there was 3X TVL, there was Liquidity Black Hole, there was uh, like, yeah, we, we created all these kind of self-reinforcing memetic taglines that drove a narrative to the point where in the last cycle, I think ThorChain hit a full FTV of like 8 billion and it was like a top three DeFi project. How did you know, understand that the meme gain was so important? Look, even back in 2017, meme coins were a thing. So, uh, believe it or not, uh, so the powerful the coins that attach themselves to memes uh, perform really well. And so Litecoin, the meme around Litecoin was always 
Bit, the silver to gold, yeah, <laughs> right. And the meme around, I mean, back in 2014, 13, 14, there was like Litecoin, Peer Coin, Feather Coin, um, but the strongest one was the Litecoin meme because the silver to gold meme, but also Bitcoin's backup, right? And I realized the Litecoin's got nothing on Bitcoin, like it literally has nothing. It's got like faster block times and different emission, 84 million or so 20. 1 million, whatever. But it, the meme of light, silver to gold was so powerful that it drove it up to huge valuations. And Charlie, you know, obviously realizes the way I valued it and that's why he dumped in 2000, December 2017. But I mean, recognize the memes drive the narrative and the narrative drives the price. And that's why Certainly. we built ThoughtChain on memes. Also on technology, hardcore technology. But it, we created all these memes around it and re relied on Norse mythology to propel it forward, to just leapfrog. Mm. Because if we were trying to build a, a project on, I don't know, some made-up name, like I don't know, I'm just looking around this room, like Epson or whatever, just like whatever, like just a whatever name, a made-up name, how do you generate a green pasture of memes from that? It's very difficult. By the way, Chainlink in 2006, 17, 21 cycle was also a big meme army around that, yeah, right? Absolutely. The uh, the Link Marines and Marines. all that kind of crazy stuff. So I was trying to like build that at the same time. And uh, Norse mythology is one of the oldest memes we have. It predates the book of Genesis. It, Norse mythology is a spoken meme, which probably formed the basis of the book of Genesis, which is wild. And the book of Genesis formed itself as a written manuscript, right? So and it probably selected from the main elements of Norse mythology because a lot of our culture, a lot of Western culture comes from Scandinavia and, and Norse and it kind of came down from there. They were the, the Norsemen were aggressive. They pushed hard. They, they battled the seas. They, they went and <laughs> did crazy things to pr propel the, the population around the world. And, and so the, that's why a lot of our mimetic narratives and uh, mimetic repository is, is based on like you know scandinavia and and, and norse and germanic germanic kind of origins which is wild crazy isn't it but when you do that you are targeting a certain type of people right because the memes are kind of more intellectual or harder to understand than if you talk about i don't know like a pepe or whatever right that's the idea. So, like, complex meme versus simple meme. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I recognize Norse mythology and like Thorchan and all of that, and is a complex meme. It's green pastures, and there's a lot there. But also, what helped it, it was like the Marvel Thor, and that generated a lot of uh, mimetic uh, narrative. That you know, lots of memes and get you know gifts that you could easily post, and you know that's why like you know the CEO being Chris Hemsworth and yeah. blah 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 <laughs> right so so there was like rich pastures there complex means but we try to simplify a lot of that like the CEO is Chris Hemsworth and Marvel Thor was to present a lot of gifts and 3x TVL was another meme and and the meme of you know uh, the liquidity black hole like blah 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 do we just try to simplify it and project that out simple taglines mm -hmm. you can latch onto but also we were very edgy like we we didn't hold back and we, with the main Twitter account and uh, with the Thor Chads and, and whatnot, we made everyone very intense and cultish because, and our brand, the brand was very bipolar. You, you couldn't, you had to either love it or hate it. You couldn't be lukewarm. And that's the correct idea is if you split your audience between hot and cold and avoid just lukewarm. So if I present you a lukewarm brand, you neither have an opinion or you don't have an opinion. Yeah. But instead of the Thought Chain brand was bipolar. You either hated it or you loved it. And that's why the Twitter account and the, and the leader of the Thought Chads was edgy and made you either hate it or love it to create this cult. Certainly. And that's, you have to create a cult. Yeah. And the attention game is exactly that too, right? You have to have an opinion. Otherwise, no one is going to... Yeah. Is, it, it, yeah. Either people hate you, either lo they love you, as you say, but they need to feel, they need to identify themselves to something, right? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So that, your first question, why do you call yourself master of the memes? Like everyone should call themselves master of the memes because, I mean, I, I've lived the memes the last six years in everything I do. I believe, like our purpose, and I don't want to drop the memes and genes too early, but fundamentally our purpose is to upgrade humanity, both mimetically and genetically. That's it. So we have at our disposal a different intelligence pathway of upgrading than the cow or the onion, hmm. right? The onion can only 
learn the universe and pass on a set of useful instructions about how to survive the universe genetically. And so it bursts a new onion and it says to it through its genetic pathways, this is how you survive the universe. You're an onion. This is what you need to do. And it gets to upgrade itself every time an onion lives and dies. Same with a cow. Cow's a bit more complex, but it learn, observes the universe, learns the universe, and passes on instructions through its genes to the next evolution and go, this, you're a cow, this is how you survive the universe. And it, and it works because we have cows with us today, right? And, but humans have a different, a much more way, a faster way of upgrading memes. And so because we have an ability to communicate, so cows can communicate. So they communicate with memes that they moo and, and, and you know, they, they do it like they communicate in nonverbal cues and non-genetically. So they can't upgrade each other's intelligence on the fly. A mother cow can teach its kid cows or calves about what not to do. And like, you know, electric fences, they can, the first cow to hit, touch an electric fence learns about it and is able to, not everyone in the herd has ever touched an electric fence, but they are able to communicate to each other, don't touch that electric fence. We don't know what happens, why it's electric, why it zaps us, but not every cow needs to get zapped by electric fence to know to not touch electric fence. So clearly they have mimetic pathways of intelligence transfer. The difference is because we have an extremely advanced speech organ and also an extremely advanced brain that's constantly curious and we've evolved to constantly ask the questions and pass on. We have at our disposal and a very advanced mimetic pathway of intelligence transfer. So it's like me telling you stuff is upgrading your intelligence right now. You don't need to live and die to upgrade your understanding of the universe to get a useful set of genetic and mimetic instructions about how to survive, mm. right? Everything, most of everything we do around us is re we rely upon our mimetic repository, right? So we have these two giant repositories, our genetic repository, which is, teaches you how to, you know, walk, to breathe, to, to have eyes and look at me, blah, blah, blah. But also you have a giant mimetic repository, which you've been learning since you were a child about how to survive 2024 here in Singapore. And, and that's how you can upgrade yourself on the fly. That's why we're so much more advanced than the dolphin or so much more advanced than the cow. So you said the first project you've done, people knew you. Then you said, I choose to be anonymous because of a certain reason, right? And now, a few months ago, you did a complete U-turn again to go all in personal branding. Why? Right, so I hand over the project, uh, ThoughtChain, and I'm very uh, loosely involved. I, I help poke the system in certain directions, but there's, you know, we, when ThoughtChain first launched, there were a set of individuals, myself included, who could unilaterally control the thing. I mean, the thing launched with four nodes, four nodes. Now it's got a hundred and... 104 nodes, at one point it had 120 nodes, and but it's pretty stable around the 100 node mark, right? So at one point it's completely centralized around those four nodes, but it slowly has become decentralized and proven that decentralization. So today I, it cannot absolutely, and by the way, probably three years ago was the last point, two years ago, which I could ever have unilaterally controlled the chain, if that makes sense. Mm. So it's completely decentralized. So today I cannot unilaterally, there's nothing I can do to, to stop that thing churning its blocks and observing transactions and doing swaps, literally nothing. So now's the correct point at which I should come out and prove the system decentralized because it's all handed over. It's all the community run it, right? And then I had my bandwidth opened up. What am I going to do next? Because I feel like that we're only halfway through the journey of a true DEX, you know, and I want to keep building. I want to keep solving the hardcore problems, but also nobody else is doing it. Well, a lot of people are doing it, but I want to do it in a bigger way. And I recognize that by just showing people and getting in the arena and building big, and I've got a lot of energy to do that, and I believe in myself to do that, and conviction, I can, rather than trying to uh, edu pass on my information, at the start of this year, I, was, I started a fund. I was investing in other founders. And I realized a lot of these other founders that I'm investing in and relying on to like create value and build big products were either naive or new, new to the founder and didn't have the experience I've had. So then I thought maybe I should just invest in myself and build something big and show everyone else, perhaps this is how you can probably this build. Mm. So what I'm about to do over the next, this cycle, the next four or five years is build a very large project, get in the arena, show everyone that you can just get in. You may make mistakes, you may do the wrong things, but it's more important to get in the arena and start building. So it's a long-winded answer, but I'm, trying to set an example 
by relying upon six or seven years of building hardcore uh, to, to try and activate more people to build. Which is definitely the limitation of anonym, anonymity, right? Because no one can relate to... We, I mean, yes, the CEO is Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth, right? But Ethereum has Vitalik, right? Solana has Anatoly. You need to have, at some point, to get maybe to an either, in a, even bigger scale, a, a leader that you can relate to. Yeah, that's true. What's the limitation of staying yeah, anonymous? And, yeah, exactly. So Lena couldn't ever project. She never went to conferences and panels. She never did podcasts. Uh, she couldn't. She was relying on everyone else to market the protocol and spread the message. She could post memes mm. and tweet through the ThorChain Twitter account, but she couldn't do anything more than that. She was very limited. And so by handing over the protocol and stepping away from that and shedding that persona and uh, going, well, right, it's time to build. It's time to build big and build hard. But I can't control the protocol anymore. It's decentralized. So it's actually much safer now for me to get out and build big mm -hmm. and bring attention and capital and flows and interfaces and mind share and power to decentralized liquidity with ThorChain as a base. Totally. Uh, for sure. Now's the time. And, you know, you can, uh, anyone can try and ring me up and go shut the chain down. And my, the, my only answer is unable to, I'm literally unable to. So, so, it, so ThorChain is safe. I can't influence it anymore. And I'm safe because nothing in the short-term jars can affect me anymore. So now's the time. You're building in public. What does that mean? Build in public, set the memes free. Right? If you're building secret, you are just, you have the wrong approach to what you're building. Like I said, and I hinted at before, our purpose is to upgrade humanity, genetically and mimetically. So genetically have kids, mimetically, as in contribute to highly potent means with a long half-life. If you're building in secret, you are trying to withhold information from the rest of humanity that could be useful, yeah. right? You're actually trying to uh, is accumulate and uh, grab value in for yourself. You, you are trying to withhold useful information from humanity when that information should be free. And so I meet a lot of people who are building closed source products, useful closed source products. And I'm saying like, why? It's a useful, set the memes free. Let all of humanity have it. Upgrade humanity's memetic repository. I don't believe in NDAs. I don't believe in copyright. I don't believe in trademarks. I don't believe in patents. All of that should be ripped apart. The good ideas flourish, the bad ideas die. The reason why people protect information like that is purely because they want to uh, extract value at the margin. Is it not easy to say that or easier to build in public when you made hundreds of millions versus I would say there is a maybe potentially natural way to think more being, ex, you know, value extractor when you kind of haven't made it yet versus, and probably it would still create much more value for yourself to share everything, right? But it's kind of like in the human nature to say, I'll keep this for myself. I don't want people to know. The classic thing is when someone says, uh, I have an ID, I'm like, yeah, what, what is it? Oh, I can't tell you. And then you don't understand that actually it's all execution. It's not the idea, right? Ideas are cheap. Execution is everything. And I'll tell you what, if you build in public, you are accelerating the, the rate of your idea spreads. But the most important thing, you're far more investable. You're far more able to direct people's time and effort and their capital in your direction. So as a founder of a, pro of a product, you're hoping to attract mind share, time share, effort share, and capital share, and refocus that to, to help a good idea flourish. And if that good idea is flourish, you hope to actually make margin on that good idea. But if your only point, your only purpose is to make margin and end it there, then that's why you want to build in secret. You want to, you want to make sure that nobody else has your really good idea so you can maximally extract value from it. Mm -hmm. But skip past that. You're not actually a true founder. You're not a true builder if all you're trying to do is build for money. And I'll tell you why. You have finite time and effort. You hope to convert your finite time and effort into ultimately just genes and memes. That's all your purpose here on humanity is, to upgrade humanity itself. Take your scarce time and effort and convert it into genes and memes. You can keep it as value. Value is stored time and effort. So that's what money is. Money is an ability for you to buy someone else's time and effort. You can buy your, you take your scarce time and effort, 
you, and you store it, and it allows you to to trans transport time, the ability to purchase someone's time across time and space, mm-hmm. right? But you should take all that value and immediately direct other people's time and effort to to in a mimetic direction to setting a good idea free. That's actually your purpose there. And by the way, a founder in the arena, building in public, attracting time and market and capital share is far more investable than anyone else. And I'm, I tell you that as both a founder and an investor. Certainly. W- one guy who really understood the, that very early was uh, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, who was saying, look, I'll just make videos in 2006 on... I'll teach you anything you need so you never need me, right? Yeah. And he was saying, if you're a gardener, you should teach your village online, right? Tell them everything that they need to know to never have to hire you. And that's the reason they will hire you, right? And in that sense, it's just hiring, it's not investing, but like the more you share stuff out there, the more pe- you create trust, the more you create brand, and the more people will be attracted to you, right? Exactly. Is that, is that exactly that? So if, if you're a founder and you have a good idea, just put it out there, build in public, take and make mistakes in public, mm. immediately fix them, right? You become extremely investable because you have people's attention because they're just like mesmerized by you, yeah. right? You're like, you're putting yourself out there. You're in the arena. You're showing the mistakes you're about to make and you navigate those mistakes. And as an investor, I look to founders who can, I, a founder doesn't has no idea the problems they're going to face over the three, five, 10 year journey of building. Right. So as an investor, I, I think, are you going to solve the problems, all the problems between where you are here and where you need to get? And you need, as a founder, as you're pitching me, you need to prove to me that you can solve those problems. But if I could just jump on and look at your Twitter feed or your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed and realize you've been solving hardcore problems the entire time, you become extremely investable. You've given me the proof of your ability to navigate the adversity and build. Yeah, absolutely. So that's why just absolutely. every founder out there immediately push all your code to GitHub, open source, scratch your stupid business license, your, your copyright, your trademarks, NDAs, put it straight on GitHub right now, open source, yeah. open up a Twitter feed, a YouTube account, literally have a camera following you around. If you're building a hardware startup, like a super secret hub or so, literally show the whole world what you're building. You will attract time and capital allocation, mind share. Yeah. It's like a math problem where... You could say, I'm going to write down the entire development so the teacher can see, even if I get the wrong answer, they can see my, the way I think, right? Correct. Or I just write the answer and hope it's, it's correct or not, right? And if both answers are wrong, one is going to enable the person to, to see exactly what kind of person you are and therefore like believe in you still. Yeah. The other one won't, right? Correct. I had a... Um, so yeah, I, like especially people in hardware, it's wild to me, like people in hardware, they pitch me startups to invest and they go, oh, what's your email? I'm going to send the NDA over. And I literally laugh at them and go, I'm not touching anything about me. Do not send me an NDA. I'm not even interested anymore. And they get offended. <laughs> I'm like, set the memes free. Immediately burn that NDA. Mm. Immediately take your hardware startup, put it up on YouTube. And I say to them, scratch your NDA, post for the next month on YouTube what you're building and I'll come back and watch all your YouTube videos and then I'll decide to invest. And they, they look at me like I'm crazy, but they, they will they will never get it. So I can't help them anymore. That's because you're very practical. Well, actually, we're going to talk about that later, but it's so practical and it's it, it's the same as I've always been thinking in business. We, in, a nor, in a good business relationship, we, would, we wouldn't even need contracts because the whole thing is set on if I do good work, you're going to pay me because you want more, right? And like the the, the dynamic is, being as practical as possible. I mean, maybe it's a bit naive and sometimes I got screwed for that, but it's, it's a very similar way of thinking, which is just all these rules and things that complicate everything. Yeah. Just for, forget that because if you're doing something really good, you're going to attract people and also the people who work with you will still want to work with you because you're doing something really good, right? And it's probably benefiting them too. So it's just, yeah, it's a very, it's a very logical and practical way of thinking instead of complicating everything. Simplify it. That's it. Well, it's, so if you go to my website, jpthor.com, um, work in progress, like, like it literally, it, it, everything's work in progress that I do. Right. And if I've, even if I've got a spelling mistake on my website, people DM me on Twitter, I go, you yeah, know, I'll fix it. <laughs> so I was like, I don't care. Like everything's a work in progress. So if you go to my website right now, I've got six principles and one of them is build in public. Another one is simplify it. Just simplify it. Just, just don't overcomplicate it. 
Like even to the point is, do not have a signature block in your email because you add bandwidth. You, you take people's bandwidth and the, you add latency. Like dealing with lawyers and accountants, oh my gosh, they, they love filling their emails up with stupid signature blocks and so do like most government departments. It's like <laughs> you are adding to latency here. You are tying up my bandwidth because I'm scrolling this stupid email thread and I'm looking for like the one or two words that I need to like ping into and I'm scrolling past a stupid signature block. Delete. I, I literally tell everyone, delete your stupid signature block. I don't want to see it. I tell everyone this and not everyone listens because they don't get it. The thing is about, it's more important to have a stupid logo there or a stupid like <laughs> contact. I know where your contact details are. Yeah. Right? It's literally in this email. <laughs> like just, just don't have anything. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's wild how much capital and, and, in, and effort is tied up in stupid little things that, <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. Like every time I interact with the government department, it's mm. once again just, it's just tying up bandwidth. And I'd love to get to a point where I just completely overhaul an entire government department or an entire government itself. Just literally just use this a simple Google form or something just so like turn entire departments into just Google forms. That's what they are, really, to be honest. There's so there's so much to just simplify. This is something we talk about for hours. Just thinking about the inefficiencies of organizations, right? And corporate and politics. And how much is not even, not just latency, but it's also how much money is wasted just by all this bullshit, right? But anyway, <laughs> okay, anyway. I, I correct people as fast as possible. Like, for example, I was in a Telegram chat the other day, and I was trying to get information across. And the person I was asking asked me, "How should I share?" He shared the information, <laughs> like yeah. as in, like, do you want me to give the information in an email or WhatsApp or or? Do you, I'm like, just give me the freaking information <laughs> in this chat right now. Do not ask me how to send the information. Just literally give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild how many, like, people are not trained to think like this. Just security. Yeah. It's kind minimum, of- like, they they think, oh, <laughs> they, they, they might offend me or if I just give yeah. me the information in the wrong way. Yeah. I'm wanting a specific bit of information for you. I don't care how you get it to me. Just do, give me the information. Do you think you're a good manager? Because you're so direct. I have the same problem. I'm so direct that a lot, most people, they need you to go. If you have something especially bad to say, you need to go to have a lunch for 55 minutes. How was, how was your wife? How was your blah, blah, blah. And then you do a hug. And then the last five minutes you say, okay, this went wrong. But that's like kind of how pe- most people, they need that. Otherwise they feel like they're attacked, right? If you're so direct, I'm a terrible manager because I, I'm impatient and I'm too direct, right? What about you? If you call me, I will literally answer the phone with go. <laughs> I'm serious. Everyone knows me as the go guy because, <laughs> because they expect me to have this kind of like 10 second, 30 second small talk about the weather or whatever. Or I literally just say, I answer my phone and say, go. I already know who it is. And they'd like, there's like a five second pause when I'm like, go. And they're like, okay, this is what I wonder if you. I'm like, thank you. See you, bye. Okay. Like, you know, anyway, whatever. But no, I'm not, I'm not a very good manager. I, I lead from the front. And people either get it or they don't. It's a filter. If you can't tolerate direct information transfer, then don't work with me. You have a wife and a daughter, right? Yeah. yeah. How do you change? Or are you the same at home? Go. Like, how do you, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> a woman needs did something different from her man, right? <laughs> but if, you, if you're always on, right? Always we talk about on. Accelerism and all that stuff afterwards. Like, how do you kind of disconnect and become like a more kind of human person? I'm very human. I know my daughter is exactly like me. She is extremely extroverted, extremely high energy. So she's going to grow up like, and like our kids are always more intelligent than we are. They have genetically had a more advanced set of instructions, probabilistically. Mm-hmm. That's true. It's kind of not true with how we humans have evolved. Like we're actually genetically uninvolving. You know, I'll get to that in a second point. Mm-hmm. Because we, we do this artificial uh, selection of yeah, you know, I'll get to, <laughs> there's a bit of a deep dive there. I don't want to get into it too much. But anyway, genetically, humans are unevolving. That's that's kind of fact. But anyway, my daughter will have a more advanced memetic repository to understand and learn from. So she will be more intelligent than me. She'll have more agency, more output, and more intelligence at her disposal than I do. Right? That's fact. And so I look at her and I, I'm just trying to like pump into information as fast as possible. And when I'm with her, I'm just constantly like, challenging you like I pull out my phone and get it to do my like, maths on my number pad or whatever because it's like literally I want her 
to be supercharged into that mimetic repository. So by the time like she's 15, 18, she's got the mimetic understanding of like a 30 year old. There's mm. like, how quickly can I get the memes mm. into her? Like is, is kind of how I interact with her. Um, my wife is a GP, so she's a doctor, very smart actually. Um, she, she's got a really, uh, like she's a GP, so very smart, smart woman, but she's very introverted. So I have to kind of bring down my energy levels with my wife else it gets too crazy. But I actually think I'm good at that. I, if I'm in output mode, then you just have to deal with me. I'm in full output because I'm trying to build something. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in negotiation mode or I'm trying to build a relationship rapport, I actually match my energy levels back down to the person I'm meeting with. Yeah. It's an important skill. Something I didn't plan to talk about, but maybe it's what you wanted to talk about before, but you didn't kind of um, expand on is you said our kids are basically smarter than us, right? Yeah. But there is, I saw a video the other day that kind of went viral on Twitter from uh, Professor Scott Galloway, who, who was saying the 30 years old today is the first time that they're struggling more than their parents at the same age, right? Which means that even if we're getting smarter one way or another, because of the way the world is evolving, for someone who is 30 years old today, it's much harder than their parents to do as well except a few minority, which are people who are maybe entrepreneurs and building a lot of things. The other ones are kind of struggling with a lot of things, right? Right. That's because they are completely distracted and they're stuck in this consumption death spiral. It is a failure of society itself. So part of what I'm trying to do is reactivate humanity. I'm trying to spread a hardcore accelerationist manifest, like idea and ex accelerate. I'm trying to live the ASO lifestyle and, and communicate it to everyone I can because accelerationism allows you to recognize one, your purpose is to upgrade humanity itself and to give you a, an ability and a set of principles to do that. But it's to recognize that we're here to create and not consume. So the, the, the people stuck in this consumption do loop, I call it like do loop. It's like do, 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 do. And you ride back to where you were and you're stuck in a do loop. And like, you just can't escape this kind of consumption do loop. Uh, or you can call it death barrel because you don't actually do anything. You're going to slowly die and not actually achieve anything. And so our youth and, our, and our, you know, the people around us are, are like massively distracted and they've been taught the wrong thing. They are taught everywhere they look, it's, it's basically accumulate as much value as you can and, you know, be wealthy and then sit on that and then die. But no, it's not. Your purpose is to upgrade humanity itself. If our kids were taught that they are literally there to learn about the universe as fast as possible and upgrade humanity itself, by creating, that they will skip past all that nonsense. They'll be supercharged. Mm. But they go to schools and they think it's a box ticking exercise, right? There's no purpose. Like, why are they there? They sold a dream to just accumulate wealth, buy a house, and and I have a nice car and flex on Instagram, and that's it. Like, there, there's no meaning for that, right? There's no purpose. And there's no like. And how does that person defend themselves with the upcoming onslaught of bots? Because bots about to wipe out 90% of our labor force right? or centralize 90% of our labor force. Like how is that person going to survive that problem? Because these bots are going to serve them an infinite content machine. So right now you scroll Instagram, right? It's that app is actually tracking your finger movement and where you scroll and where you re-scroll to. And like TikTok does this even crazier. But soon in the next five years, you will have on-demand infinite content at your disposal and you won't even need to scroll. You won't, it will, this device that you'll stick on your head will measure your heart rate. It will look at your eye tracking. It will read your, the energy levels and the, 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 the kind of it'll read into your brain and work out which parts of your brain have been activated. And it will know exactly, you won't even need to prompt it. You won't even need to, the people think, oh, they better prompt. I want to watch a movie of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in a space Star Wars style movie. And then 30 seconds later, it will generate an entire movie for them, which they will merely watch and then delete. That's the interim. Mm. Ultimately, you won't even need to prompt it. It will know exactly what you want to see, yeah. right, in the next level, and it will serve you that content. And and but and in a socialist government with UBI, you'll be paid every taken all your needs taken care of, your health we're taken care of, your your everything will be around you, be so easy. You'll you'll be zombified by this infinite content machine and your universal basic income. And all your time and effort, which is the only thing scarce that you have, will be stolen off you. Mm. And so these people that wander around like scrolling TikTok every day, 
they are going to end up zombified. And that is going to happen. And that's going to cause a collapse of humanity itself. If 90% of humanity is stuck in these pods, which zombified them because they served an infinite stream of content, sugar, and money, the universal base income, they're trapped. Who is benefiting? It's the person that's able to steal the time and effort to essentially control their vote to keep governance and power. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause a collapse of humanity itself. And that's what I'm most worried about. But it's happening already. Oh, 100% it's happening. If we're honest with ourselves, it's completely happening and it's not getting better. Yeah. So uh, people think... Uh, the internet or the, like these devices around us are bad. Like that's like kind of mental model right now is, oh, like don't give kids, you know, div- a screen time or whatever. Okay, they don't give kids screen time. But remember, these things are just tools. If you see this device as a tool for consumption, you're dead. You're basically a walking zombie in the next 10 years. But if you see that device, and by the way, I spend probably far more time on my devices than even like a Instagram or a TikToker but I use it to create, mm. I use it to output, I use it to, to change and upgrade humanity's memetic repository. I cre- use it to create memes. I bought a helicopter to, to express my agency, my output and create memes. That's why I'm flying that helicopter around the world from the North and South Pole in two years with another machine with a camera attached on it. Why? To create memes. I don't actually care. The helicopter is a brilliant manifestation of our of our latest understanding of aeronaut engineering and composites and helicopter aerodynamics and blah, blah, blah. And like, I don't care about the helicopter. It's a cool machine. I'm not even flying it right now. It's at home in my hangar. Uh, but I use it to create memes to, to spread a message and get people's attention. Mm-hmm. It's an output device, Absolutely. right? It's not a consumption device, right? And everything I do around me, everything I have are output devices. Mm-hmm. They are leverage devices, amplification devices. Nothing, and anything I own that I use is like, that I don't use, I, I flip off, I sell off. Mm. I don't need it. I, everything I have should just be an output device. So be a creator, not a consumer. Right, but create useful stuff <laughs> because there's two types of memes. Oh, there's like yeah. high velocity memes that are flash in the pans. Yeah. And then I, there's highly potent memes that have a long half-life. So if you generate the latest like viral video on, on TikTok, yeah, it's a highly vo- high velocity meme. It spreads around the world very quickly and then it dies very quickly. And then one week later, you know, people have forgotten about you. And you haven't actually changed and upgraded humanity. You, will for- you haven't created a set of useful instructions to survive the universe. Yeah. Isaac Newton did, 4C equals MA. Albert Einstein did, you know, E equals MC squared. What did they do? They sat there, they observed the universe, they thought... They relied on a mimetic repository, which they understood quite well as a basis of their intelligence. And they they arrived at a new intuition about how the universe op works. The apple falling from the tree, you know, F equals MA. And then they worked hard to spread that meme, mm. right? So the same with Albert Einstein. He, he, he relied upon, he understood the latest evolution of the mimetic repository of science he observed the universe, he thought about it, he applied his intelligence, and he upgraded upgraded humanity itself, E equals MC squared, right? But that's a very useful meme with a long half-life. However, it's still a meme. It's We will get to the point in the future where we'll have the robots, the silicon machines, that can perceive the universe with much greater fidelity and precision than we can, and they'll have at their disposal much higher compute power so they, with more advanced observation in the universe, is much higher compute power, will be able to arrive at memes which are more correct than E equals MC squared or force equals MA. And that's wild. Because remember, those are just memes, right? And our understanding will be upgraded of the universe. Isn't that just crazy? So what you're saying is that the meme that is valuable and useful to survive in the universe will have a long half-life, but it that, will but always have a half-life. And it's going to accrue much more value in time, right? Yeah. So, so there is kind of like a, um, a mechanic that is rewarding the useful and valuable memes much more than the other ones, right? How do we apply that to crypto? Uh, I was talking with Meow, the founder of Jupiter, and he's saying every, every coin is a meme coin. Every token is a meme coin. Yeah, and Bitcoin itself is a meme coin. What is the meme of Bitcoin? Digital gold. 
Well, there's like, yeah, there's like I mean, there's, a, there's a burnt, the layers right? upon layers of memes. But the, the fundamental meme of Bitcoin is that it's 0. 0.00 on the monetary properties chart. Okay. So it's finite, it's scarce, it's the oldest, right? Every, you can take Bitcoin and you try and create a permutation of it. Mm. So change the supply to 84 million. That's Litecoin, reduce the block time. So you, it's 0.00 because it's the first, got the longest Lindy effect, right? And it's not infinite supply and it's not, it's finite supply. It's actually uh, a, a supply will actually you reduce over time through lost coins and, and whatnot. But it's at 0.00, right? And you cannot repeat that, that you cannot have a Bitcoin also at 0.00 that's, you know, 15 years old, has, is up to a supply of like 19 and a half, 20 million, right? You cannot repeat that, right? You can take Bitcoin and you try to create another one, but you're going to move it away from 0.00 and you can put it separately in the universe and you have to attract the, build a shelling point around. You can't do that. So the big meme of Bitcoin is it's, it's, it's the monetary asset that is the oldest digital, but it's also a finite supply asset. It's, it has the strongest memes around it. Mm. Which is why it's the biggest coin of all. And forever will be. You cannot replace Bitcoin. And now, interesting thing on Bitcoin itself is uh, the only thing finite is your time and effort, right? So Bitcoin is, and you take your time and effort and you convert it into value, right? So the most useful measure of value is the uh, the asset that's able to essentially measure delta entropy. So that entropy is the change of usefulness of energy of the universe. Mm. And so the universe is basically expanding in entropy continuously. Mm. So it started with very, very useful energy, you know, very acute energy, and it's slowly expand, reducing the usefulness of that energy and expanding expanding entropy of the universe. So when, and basically Bitcoin measures delta entropy most accurately because it's essentially able to take useful energy and it gets converted into waste heat. So it increases the entropy of, of the, the world. And so it's able to essentially prove that an entropy change occurred, mm. right? And because your time and effort is you directly contributing to an entropy change in the universe, so you eat food and you convert that food into glucose and that glucose changes the heat. Like literally as you move around and, and you actually increase the entropy of this room right now because you are doing, you're converting energy into useful, less useful energy through waste heat, right? So your economic output is a measure of your time and effort, which is the only thing scarce you have. Bitcoin measures the entropy change of the energy that goes into computing those hashes, right? Mm. Ethereum doesn't, it's a, mm. To that same extent. So Bitcoin is the only way to reliably measure the entropy change of the world and attribute a value to it because that's all your time and effort is. So every token is a meme coin. Yep. But now we have something, this cycle, which is the main narrative, meme coins, right? The main narrative of the cycle. High velocity memes. Yeah. What's your thought on that? You're a big meme fan, right? Since years. What do you think about meme coins? So you're talking about high velocity memes. So like a typical meme can, that gets dump, dumped by a celebrity, you know, they have lock liquidity. You, they used to, it, back in a few years ago, you, you know, you would drop uh, a coin in a liquidity pool and the founders would rug it, right? Mm -hmm. So we quickly stopped rugging. People were worked out. You don't want to touch a coin that get rugged. So now on these all meme, these meme coins, they lock the liquidity and they launch at a really low FTV and then they pump it, right? And so that, that's kind of evolved over time. But what, what do these meme coins do? They're called meme coins, but they're just high velocity memes that extract value from a community. What about the Pepe or Weef? Do things the same? Because I'm thinking about meme coins in like kind of three categories. You have Dogecoin, like the kind of like Bitcoin of meme coins, there for 10 years, I think, or 11 years. And then you have these kind of newer sort of memes that uh, meme coins like Pepe or with Pepe, for example, I mean, it's from last year. They, there was problems in the beginning with the developers kind of dumping. Yeah, they like send it to Vitalik and Vitalik solves half it or whatever. But then anyway. it, it kind of survived that. 
and it seems that it's fairly distributed and kind of getting bigger and like big enough with li big enough liquidity that it could become something, right? And then you have all these kind of shitcoin memes that are, you know, launching one day worth a lot. Then, so, I mean, like every every coin's a meme coin. So, as this meme grows, well, and every every meme has a half life, right? Mm. So you're fighting a half life against new inflow. So like a high velocity meme has a very quick half-life. Can the inflow of people outpace the half-life of that coin? Mm. Well, these little coins, no, absolutely not. Like the celebrity drops it, immediately dumps it, and the half-life is accelerated and inflow stop, right? So for example, a more mature coin like Whiff or, or meme coin, uh, you know, Pepe or whatever, do, is the half-life of that coin long enough or short enough to beat the inflows mm. of the new people being attracted to the meme. That's all it is. Yeah, absolutely. So Bitcoin has a half-life, right? But the problem is, so if, if 9 billion people were using Bitcoin, right, it will slowly have a half-life. There'll, there'll be a point at which something could replace Bitcoin ultimately. Will it beat that? By the way, we're nowhere near because we're only like 100 million, 200 million people in Bitcoin mm. and we're going to get to like 9 billion. So the inflow of people into Bitcoin outpace its half-life. But in 200 years' time, right, do you think Bitcoin will, will have a half-life? But what is the half-life of Bitcoin? That's the next one. Like when 9 billion people use Bitcoin, right, and it does measure the economic output of the world, what is half-life? Well, I'll tell you what, in 100 years' time, we're going to be in space. And by the way, Bitcoin is, has a hash horizon. It's only 20 minutes. Mm. So Bitcoin... A hash horizon is limited to 20 minutes. Anything outside the speed of light times 20 minutes, Bitcoin can't touch. What if all of humanity leaves Earth and goes into space? Right? Bitcoin will implode mm. because, and then so that that will demonstrate its half life. The nine billion people that move the inflowed into Bitcoin, ultimately the low key of that nine billion people moved away from Earth because mm. they all went to space, all went to Mars, or a humanity itself imploded. And so then the value of Bitcoin imploded as well. Everything has a half-life. Mm. Every business too, right? If you think about it, every business, every business is going to die one day. Tesla is a meme, right? But what's the half-life of Tesla, yeah. right? Because the, the inflow, you know, remember, the half-life has to be slower than the inflow. Well, the inflow has to beat the half-life, yeah. right? More yeah. people need to be joining. Like the, the nuclear reaction can needs to keep, keeps growing before it can start going through decay. All right. So Tesla is doing that because Elon is just constantly taking all the dollars created in profit and reinvesting back in. I'll tell you what is on a precipice right now, Apple. Apple are about to face a half-life. They, they, they spend all the profit on share buybacks, mm. right? Yeah. That's the difference between Tesla. Elon spends all their profit on building more for the future, he's building five years, 10 years ahead. SpaceX is another example, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an example where he's using the capital flow of the company to, to keep pushing the half-life further and further out and cre keep increasing the inflow. Apple, under the stewardship of Tim Cook, is about to show you it has a half-life right, right now because there is no innovation happening in that company. They're, they're using all their money to just do shit. They've spent like $600 billion on share buybacks. Mm. 600 billion could have got you, could have solved nuclear fusion. It could have solved like the rocket problem. It, like 600 billion yeah. could have built a giant accelerator tunnel to ship pods into the space, internet pods or space branch or what, anything, but they wasted it. Yeah, I think it's Jeff Bezos saying, I think it's a three year time frame, but it could be like, depending on the side of the business, I guess it's like longer, but whatever you're doing today, you're going to see the results in three years in the business, right? Maybe if it's a huge business, whatever you do today is going to be in five years or in 10 years. So maybe you can also afford to be a bit more chill or just buy back your shares instead of investing in innovation. And you don't see the actual consequences of your uh, decisions or action until later, right? But at some point it's going to hit. Yep. At some point it's going to hit. Correct. One of the refreshing facts when studying you is that you're extremely practical, as I said before. Yeah. A key trait that many founders in general lack. You think very practically about, about the big problems in the industry and then solve them. Right. Yeah. What, are, what are the top problems in our industry right now? 
and what's your attempt to solve them? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple layers here. So the, the problem I'm trying to solve at the moment is that the interface aggregate, there's no large branch that can wrap and abstract all of DeFi. There's 200 million users on Binance, there's 20 million users on MetaMask, there's probably 2 million users on DeFi. There's a difference of 100x there. And why? It's because DeFi is too complex. Mm. DeFi needs to be abstracted. DeFi needs a giant decent, decentralized friendly brand that's going to bring 100 million users in and put them safely on chain. Mm. So that's that's deck as well. That's what I'm trying to build right now. But also, uh, people are users are scared of self custody, and because of all these wallets are single signature. So building Thorchain, we built around a hardcore MPC protocol, which basically splits up key shares around 100 nodes. The fully open source, fully in the public. If you can attack it, you can steal $1 billion, right? But it's got non-zero amounts of value in its vault every single day. So clearly it's a secure protocol, touch wood. And I t basically took that to, to build a multi-factor wallet called Vaultisig. And you log into your Gmail or your Discord with, with two-factor, but you don't log into your MetaMaster two-factor. So I'm trying to solve that and share it, share it with the users. It's a complete open source or audited and build in public. So self-custody, a giant brand to abstract DeFi, uh, like two problems I'm trying to devote to solve at this point in time. But also, there's a wider narrative problem. And DeFi is not exciting. Uh, all the attention is over meme Absolutely. coins and CDFi, which I despise. Like CDFi just has gotten nowhere. Mm -hmm. you know? So don't touch any of that stuff. Uh, but also like LSTs, which also fundamentally, like they're all promising decentralization, but they're all centralized. So we're not, we haven't, we're back, it's 2024. You shouldn't touch anything that's that's holding people's money in a, in a centralized way. All these CD5 protocols use multi-sigs. It's like, come on, we were we were trying to improve upon multi-sig back in 2018. How do you rekindle the DeFi flame? Well, we want to basically just kickstart this narrative, like DeFi Summer 2.0. We need someone who's willing to get in the arena, create a narrative change, put themselves on the line, risk their own time, effort, capital, brand. And I'm, I'm taking that on right now. I want to get in the arena and challenge people's ideas of what DeFi is. If I challenge that, I mean, obviously it's extremely useful for advancement of the space, right? But people in this space are kind of DGENs and they want to have fun. And they might just say, oh, this DeFi stuff, yeah, it's important, but it's boring. Right, I prefer the meme coin both. Well, that's why I've got this so, Project Chaos. It's going to be not boring. It's going to be chaotic and it's going to be fun. Okay. And so Project Chaos is, you know, I'm raising $20, $30 million to literally attack all of DeFi via Vampire. Mm. I'm literally commoditizing Vampire attacks to get in the arena and do protocol versus protocol wars. Everything you ever wanted to do to, to just governance attacks, liquidity attacks, whatever, just get in the arena and just throw some stuff down range. I'm risking my own capital to do it as well. Because if I can make DeFi fun again and create some money games and some attention, then we can bring some attention back to DeFi. So that's a big play. I mean, it might not work, whatever, but I'm in the arena having a crack. Mm. But also, there's no like charismatic leaders uh, who can project a, a, a good example of what to do. You know, we, we, we did have charismatic leaders and they either get exhausted and leave or they, they either tell too many lies or make too many spakes, mistakes or go too much on the leverage mm. and they blow up. Mm. Uh, so, and there's plenty of examples of that, right? Plenty. So, I had a few of them on the podcast actually end up in jail or <laughs> yeah, no, <it's> just, happens. <laughs> I mean, like it's it's a it's crypto is an emerging industry. It's not clear what's right and wrong most of the time. I mean, generally, if you have a good moral compass of what's right and wrong, then don't tell me to, don't tell lies, don't cover, don't build it. Like if you don't go too much in the leverage, don't tell too many lies. Uh, own it and don't rug and don't steal and blah, blah, blah. If you're like, there's a pretty general set of rules that if you follow, then you'll most establish. I mean, there are some cases like the Tornado Cash developer um, and even like CZ who, you know, um, I mean, yeah, like it's unfortunate, but that's unfortunately our kind of uh, like the industry right now. There's no certain clear regulatory certainty and there's kind of, unfortunately, some examples being made right now. You talked about um, Vultisig, right? A multi-factor wallet. Yes. What is Vultisig if you had to explain it to your mother? Vultisig is just a safe wallet that's multi-factor. What does that mean? Okay, so you log into your Gmail, your bank account with multi-factor, two-factor, right? Mm. So you should be able to log in into your crypto wallet with a two-factor. Mm. But it's on-chain two-factor. 
So you basically need two thing, two devices to sign a transaction. So if a hacker downloads your phone uh, or like you download a PDF in your Discord, you're not going to lose all your money. Mm. Mm. Look, it's multi, uh, multi-factor is not perhaps for the per- person with a small amount of money in crypto, mm. but it's for the per- person with a lot of money in crypto that's active. And here's the thing. I believe that money's only going to get hotter. Money's only going to get more online. And the reason is because it's going to be more and more bots. And these bots are going to get one paid all the time. And the bots are going to pay each other a lot. So we have to, I reject the notion that money should stay offline. Mm. That Bitcoin should be in these coal vaults, lock, you know, 100 foot under Norway, you know, or in Iceland in the bottom of a well somewhere. No, no, no. <laughs> put that Bitcoin online safely. But you can't put Bitcoin online in a single signature wallet because as time goes on, the likelihood of having a key compromise goes up, right? You, the only way to keep crypto online safely is with multi-factor devices, like two-factor, three-factor. Naval Ravikan calls Multisig the final evolution of wallet. What does that mean? Well, it's it's true. It's it's basically a wallet that works for all the chains that have ever existed and that ever will exist, uh, and it's completely off-chain. It's completely... Uh, and 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 uh, like it supports everything and it co-signs everything like it's the ability to put crypto safely online mm. you can't get more safer than a multi-factor crypto wallet you can't and we just have to like solve some parts of the user experience right so right, right now i'm funding an upgrade to our mpc protocol to enable kind of one round signing which is a way faster and way more reliable method of signing between two devices But I was talking with some large crypto phone makers and they think that they're going to get the millions of users to when they set the phone up, they're going to write down a 12-word phrase on an Android phone. It's going to come with a little piece of paper and as you set up this Android phone, they expect their users to pull out a pen and paper (laughs) and write 12 words down and be secure. And I was like, are you guys... Are you guys saying this outside aloud to yourself right now? I'm like, this is the solution. It should be a multi-factor device. They shouldn't need to be writing 12 words down. Of course. I've declared war on seed phrases. No more seed phrases. Get rid of those damn things. And any any manufacturer of a wallet, hardware, software, whatever, that's still entertaining the idea of single seed phrases, what are you doing? Please talk to me. I can help solve you. Solve that problem. It should be multi-factor. How do you build enough trust in that product to have people move large sum? Is the problem of, I mean, what's the problem of ThorChain too? Is the problem of all these CD5? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can do a bunch of things. So we can audit it over and over again. We can open source it. We can slowly build up a re- relationship with our users. We, when we're doing this right now, it's like, but it relies on, you know, six-year-old MPC technology that's been, mm. that survives the test of time. And, but we just need to manage that with our users. Uh, and it's not going to be an overnight thing. Uh, but once we feel like the wallet has absolutely nailed user experience, we're going to do a large airdrop to try and attract as many users as possible into it to, and, and basically move them away from single SIG into multi-SIG. Mm. How important is money to you? Money is an interim parking position for time and effort. And I, so, I mean, I got, got my hands on a large amount of wealth in the last cycle. And I could have easily sat the cycle out and watched it go to a billion dollars, right? So I was, you know, if I did nothing, I would be a billionaire this cycle. And if Bitcoin goes to 300K or whatever, then I, you know, do my math in my head, okay, all right, then mm. 10X, blah, 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 I'll go from 400 million to 4 billion, boom, billionaire. But what is, the, what is that? How is that useful to me, mm. right? Because it's more meaningful to me to build a product that meaningfully upgrades humanity than to sit on the back of a yacht with a private jet and a helicopter and and do nothing. That's meaningless to me, right? And I've full arced wealth. You know, back in 2017, I'd sold my house, sold my car, taken out a large business loan to fund myself getting into crypto. So my equity value was negative like 200K. Like I, I owed more in a debt than I did in assets. And I was catching a train to work and working at a $300 a month uh, co-working space as I ground my way through the first parts of my entrepreneurial battles, I had incredible amount of agency and output. Mm-hmm. And I went from that to a lot of money in three, four, five years, very, very quickly. And so I, then I enjoyed this money and I, well, I thought I was enjoying it, but I got to a point 
where I realized I was completely tied up in things and consumption and I had lost an, an incredibly important thing to me, which is productivity. I'd lost that productivity. I was lost the ability to create because I was so distracted in consuming things and holding onto my wealth and living this kind of wealthy lifestyle. Do you have examples, concrete examples where then you realized, fuck, what, what am I doing? What am I doing? Like I'm, I was 34 with a lot of money in a consumption death bar. I have lost all my productivity. I couldn't even, someone sent me an email for me to action. It would take me like a week to respond to that email. I'll just be like, you know, whatever. And just even just an email to action something. And that was when I realized oh, there was a significant problem. So I decided to reject all that and take all my capital, unlock it again, throw it back into the rent. I also uh, quit vaping and quit drinking. Mm. And because I was drinking a lot and uh, drinking alcohol is such a decelerant. I've probably forever quit alcohol. Alcohol is a massive decelerant. It gives you brain fog, affects your sleep, affects your productivity. I was also vaping a lot last year, probably because I was drinking a lot. And vaping is also, it gives you brain fog and affects your sleep and just throw all that out, right? And I decided to change a massive mentality change. And you know what? My wealth is an interim parking position to upgrade humanity itself. Mm. So wealth is interim. It's, a, it's an ability to steer other people's time and effort, including your own. Mm. So coming into 2024, I decided to take all my capital and throw it back in the arena, all of it. And if I need more, I will sell all my, my worldly possessions and unlock it. And I will gain back in productivity, agency, and output. That's the trade-off there. What's the moment that you said, fuck it, I'm just going to throw all my money back in there and get back into the game? It was the so 1st of January, 2004, my New Year's resolution was quit alcohol and smoking, uh, vaping. So I did that. And that kind of freed up my mind. Mm. And I started uh, expressing my agency and output. And I started building again. And probably March this year, when I'd, I'd written this kind of, I've been thinking about accelerationism for a long time, since I discovered the movement, the EAC movement, but it was very edgy. And I realized EAC is a very powerful movement, but it's not able to communicate itself. So I kind of created this movement called ACEL, short for acceleration. And that was in February. And in March, I'd written a first draft of what ACEL, everyone's like, what's ACEL? You've got ACEL everywhere, time to ACEL. I was like, no, it's time to ACEL. Time to accelerate, mm. time to get things moving again. And so as I conceptualized this idea and actually wrote it down, I created this thought stream and I've now funded a book to like turn it into like an action book mm. to, to, to share with the world how to accelerate a set of useful instructions, right? Which I ho hopefully has a highly potent with a long half-life. I realized actually I'm, I'm all in. I'm, then I, I was able to conceptualize that wealth value is a temporary parking position to create memes and genes. And most importantly, means because we're advanced mimetic creatures. Mm. And by the way, I haven't even talked about space brains and, and rockets and, and tunnels and stuff like that, but I'm a, a hiker about it. So probably about March, I decided to throw all my wealth back in the arena. So between the moment we said, I'm stopping alcohol and vaping, it took about two, three months yeah, to it, be like back into full animal mode, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. What do you mean by having a post-wealth mentality? So a lot of people who are pre-wealth think that wealth is the ultimate state, mm. right? So a post-wealth mentality, you don't need to be pre-wealth at all to, to view wealth as just an ability to direct people's time and effort to create memes. So post-wealth is like you just, you've, you realize that wealth is a parking position to do something. You want to unlock it, put it back in the arena. So I, I don't care about wealth anymore. Like the greatest value, the most wealthy thing you can do is take all your scarce time and effort and invest in your own intelligence and mimetic output. All right, that's all it is. All right. So that's post wealth mentality. It's like you you're not you're not building to accumulate wealth anymore. You're actually building and you're converting your scarce time and effort to create memes. Mm. That's post wealth. What makes you happy? Creating useful things. Useful memes and everything's a meme. So I'm most happy when I see a meme that I create flourish and spread. So we're talking about before you flying to everywhere, right? For work now, business meeting, meeting investors, building, probably not sleeping much, but probably way, way happier than when you were chilling and 
taking one week to answer your email, right? Way more, yeah, far more. Uh, it's just a far more meaningful life today. And it's far wilder for sure. But I am short circuiting my time and effort back into memes again. So I spent so much to turn my time and effort into wealth to realize that wealth is an interim position to create memes. Mm. And now I'm just taking all my time and effort and all my wealth and just directly creating memes. And that is true happiness. That's, that's true purpose. You spent several million dollars on a music festival arena. Why? More. I will, I want to, I've got <laughs> this crazy hangar back home and I want to turn it into a destination globally. I want people all around the world to fly into my A-cell hangar and it's on the side of a hill. Uh, it's where partly the helicopter and I've put it, I've filled it out with the best. Well, how did you know about this? You must be checking my Instagram, but I, I, I see you just, <laughs> no, no, no. I see you flying everywhere on the helicopter. And then I saw, I think a post on the music arena. I was like, oh yeah, yeah so music too. I've got the best sound system, the best lights, the best arena. And I want people in the, around the world to come to the ACL hangar for flagship music. And because music, I love music I, and I love music festivals. It's a high stimulation environment. There are lights, sounds, music, people, energy. Energy, yeah. Energy. energy. It's, it's energy. Like I don't go to music festivals to, to drink or take drugs or whatever. I literally go there to experience the energy of everyone. And like, like that energy, like young people just all there for the same experience and, and, and high energy with high energy music is what's amazing. And like honestly, watching Miss Monique live at Surveyor, mm was one of the, or Grimes at Coachella. I saw, I think it was both on Twitter and Instagram. You were, uh, oh. you were, you were partying in public. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, partying in public. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was posting it live. It, no, it's this high energy. So I want to, I want to create that in Darwin and I want people to, to come to the ASOL hangar and be in a high energy environment because Darwin, one, Darwin doesn't have that. And two, it, it's my hangar, my ACEL hangar, and where I can spread a message of accelerationism. You said the only scarce things are your time and efforts, nothing else is. Do you want to develop on that? Look, that, you, you have a finite amount of time on Earth, 80 years at this point. You know, maybe we, with space brains, we can get to 200 years. But in that time, and you have a battery of time, you, it was one point, Oh, completely full the moment you're born and it's slowly depleting. You will never be able to undo time, mm. right? And as you deplete your time, what do you do with it? You have an option to upgrade humanity or if you want to take that option, right? And that's the only true meaning. But you may not, you know, if you, for whatever reason, like you may not want to or may not able to upgrade humanity. And that's, that's a shame. That's unfortunate. But if you then apply your effort throughout, so you could sit on your couch and not do anything all day long, that, but that's a choice you can make. Or you can take your finite time and your finite effort and amplify it through your mimetic understanding. So basically learn how the universe operates. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you go to school to actually learn, try and learn how the universe operates. All right, you, I've been in crypto for over a decade now, since 2013. So I have an advanced understanding of how crypto works, right? And I'm amplifying, I'm using that with my finite time and effort to create useful memes. Mm. So that's what's your scarce. And you, you know, the, and value itself is scarce. And you, you are able to convert your finite time and effort into value, which you're able, you think might take that value and buy yachts and wealthy houses and blah, blah, blah. No, it's actually, you take the value and buy memes or produce memes, more memes, more memes. <laughs> More means equal more happiness. Yes, that's everyone. all that will give you happiness at or any everyone. level of wealth. Why should the human species think bigger than just the planet Earth? Right, so we have um, a genetic and mimetic repository. And as we advance the rung of intelligence, so we started billions of years ago in the primordial protein soup. And through the permutations of our environment, these tiny little organisms observe the universe, learn about the universe, and upgrade themselves. And that's been happening for billions of years. And uh, they've turned into single-cell organisms, multi-cell organisms, bacteria, fl flora, fauna. They were like swimming in the oceans and they crawled out, they got lungs, and they started walking around and they jumped to climb the trees and developed wings and flew around. 
right? And then we had we we basically constantly been genetically evolving. And at very stages of the last billion years, that our advancing intelligence has been reset a few times. I mean, just over the weekend, I was in Melbourne looking at giant dinosaur skeletons, like a T-Rex or a, t- a Triceratops. Uh, were like advanced creatures back then, much larger than they were today because of much more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's a lot more human. So the flora is much bigger. But that all got reset back down to mosquitoes, dragonflies, and crocodiles, right? And so like those advanced creatures were wiped out by some event, some catastrophic event. Mm. I mean, the moon spins at the same speed as the earth as a constant reminder to you. Every time you look at the moon, you should recognize that we should get out of this earth. The fact that the moon exists, it billions upon billions of tons was spat out of the earth's mantle, hundreds of thousands of kilometers, and over billions of years slowly coagulated under its own gravity into the moon. Every single atom in the moon spins at the same speed as the Earth. We only see one side of the moon because that object was once dust ejected from the Earth's mantle. Mm. Do you think any of our advanced creatures today, including us, could have survived another moon ejection episode? Zero. We would get reset. We would probably get reset way back through the crocodiles, way back down, probably even to single celled organisms, probably even like that will get zeroed out, right? So our entire genetic repository is under threat right now every single day of being reset back down to the crocodiles or even worse, reset back down to the building blocks of humanity itself, carbon dioxide, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. So the first absolute thing we need to do is get our genetic repository backed up out of Earth to survive such an event. The second reason is we also have this crazy mimetic repository. Like it's art, science, religion, humanity itself. Like the iPhone is built with means, the helicopter is built with means. If we had a one week long, a solar flare, uh, like coronal mass ejection event, that, that thing would turn off our electrical grids. Right? It would zero out all our transistors and take us offline for an entire seven days. Like if we had a month of CMEs, our entire fragile infrastructure around us would get turned offline and then watch out for the chaos. That could happen starting tomorrow, running for a month. There's a non-zero chance our entire magnetic field could be blown away. All our airliners would fly fly across the ends of the earth. So are you ready? Are you, because the more advanced we are, the more fragile we'll become. If I put two organisms on a desert island and said survive for three years, you and a crocodile, who's who would win? The crocodile. The crocodile is actually more resilient to the adversity of the universe than you are. You need this kind of like bubble wrap around you. Right? You, you exist in this giant kind of convoluted, heavily uh, supply chains, logistics and internet and blah, blah, blah. You could not survive on a, on a desert island for three years. The crocodile would do it in its sleep. So actually, who's more intelligent, you or the crocodile? Who can survive the universe's adversity in a more, more resilient way? In, in that situation, the crocodile could. So our mimetic repository is at risk every single day. Every single day we keep it here on earth. And by the way, it's all going online, so it's even more at risk. Uh, you know, we used to keep it in our books and our libraries, and then the only event that would threaten that was in, when the peasants would light it on fire or a giant volcano would like cover it right, in, in dust. Now all our memes are online, so a single CME can reset that out. It's it's all like a, a giant a giant event. So we absolutely need to export our genetic and mimetic repository out, as a backed up out of Earth. But more than that, like our purpose over the next billion years is to continue to explore the universe. So but you will not a biological you're a biological machine. You're a manifestation of agency intelligence in a biological form. Right. But recognize that you are mostly memes. Right. You, you're you produced through genes, but everything you've been doing for 34 years, I'd imagine 40 years, has been powered by memes, right? So you're becoming slowly more mimetically powered. And guess what? These silicon machines that we're very, probably like one decade away from creating, are be completely powered by memes. And they will have more agency and more output and more precision in observing the universe than you will. And if you view them as your servant to actually like serve your coffee at a cafe, which will zero out our labor force, then you will be turned into a paperclip if you have that opinion. Instead, we should look to the silicon machines. We should give them an advanced mimetic base to work with and a bunch of sensors to say you have a much more advanced 
uh, a much greater precision of fidelity to observe the universe, go explore the universe. You, the, these silicon machines, their purpose right, is to explore the universe. Your, we, we explored zero to 100,000 feet. We've explored the moon. But can we explore beyond that? No, because we are artificially limited. Well, we're limited through our biological machinery, your skeleton, right? Which needs, you know, you need oxygen. You need life support. But a silicon machine can zip around at 1% of the speed of light, maybe 10% of the speed. Of we, we may not ever solve for 10% the speed of light speed, even like 90% the speed of light because we don't have an advanced moment. We don't have the advanced ability to understand the universe that these machines could. They will solve how to travel at 10% the speed of light, not us. Does it mean that you are one day or another going back to your first mission, which was becoming an astronaut or? I realized that space. humans should not become astronauts. The machine should. The machine should explore the universe. The machine should upgrade a, a memetic repository. If they find in useful things, they should share it with us. Then the next question is, so the purpose of machines is to take our memes and explore the universe, right? They will figure out the problems to because they can see the universe with much greater precision. They can think way faster. They can communicate with e each other. So we can communicate at the speed of, um, I'm speaking to you. These machines will be able to communicate with themselves at the speed of light. Mm. There's no way we can compete with that. So the machi these machines should be exploring the universe as fast as possible and upgrading the, the memetic repository as they go along. So then the question is, how are we going to manage this transition between the biologic machines and the silicon machines? How are we going to stay relevant? What are the machines going to think of us? So right now, do you, have a, do you have a pet dog or a pet cat or you know someone that does? Yeah. So you you look after your pet dog and your pet cat and you care for it. It has a much better life than the, than other animals around us. Like we, I know where we, you're going. We, we look after it. We care for it because it gives us a reminder of where we come from. The silica machines are going to look to us as pets. Yeah, I hear that from, uh, is it Balaji? Or so, I don't know. Balaji, yeah, yeah. Who said something like that? Like, it, honestly, they'll look at us pets. Gonna be but much but we, we don't really want that relationship. We actually just want to send the machines on. But how are we going to actually communicate and stay relevant in these machines? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to start thinking at the speed of light and communicating with them. We need to shed our skeletons, right? And this is this is, sounds crazy. Bear with me for a second. I dropped this on Here. the pomp and it was just like mind blowing. Anyway, <laughs> no, we should. So the your skeleton is is just an ability for you to navigate Earth mm -hmm. at 1G in a 16% oxygen environment and eat food on the ground, turn to glucose, which ATP and power your brain. Your brain. Your skeleton is an ability for you to sense the universe, respond to it, and give you agency and out, an ability to create. However, what if I told you we could shed your skeleton, which is actually limited to about 80, 100 years because it ages way faster than your brain does. We could stick your brain, which is the loci of your intelligence and your senses, really, and put you in a pod that can synthetically generate all your glucose, salt, and, and oxygen needs in a highly controlled environment, shield you from the toxins and the uh, the kind of threats of your environment, right? You have a, a one centimeter thick skull to protect your brain from the chaos, the adversity around you. What if we just give you a gold-plated pod, put you in, in orbit where there's no kind of, of that threat, unfurl your solar panel so you have 24-7 power or nuclear, giving you synthetically glucose, enough glucose, sugar, and an oxygen to power you for 200 years. How long can your brain survive? Because it actually decays a lot slower than the rest of your body. My grandma was 94 years old and she was sharp as a whistle and her body failed her. So let's just, so many of these amazing brains suffocate and die because their skeletons fail them. So what I'm talking about is just get rid of the skeleton. And by the way, don't do it when you're 80, do it when you're 40. Because the earlier that you do it and the earlier that you put your brain in a safe, stable uh, you know, environment, which is in a pod in orbit, away from the chaos and the adversity of this 1G environment, the longer your brain will survive. And then you go, well, actually, will I live as a human? Yes, you will. You I wanted to say, where is the soul in that equation? No, I mean, you are your brain. You, you delegate your agency to your skeleton to walk around this earth, to catch planes, to type on your little iPhones, because it's, it's the only way for you to have agency and, and output and create. But what if I said, actually, we can take your entire sensor, your, your spinal cord, which is 69 million neurons, and by the way, a neuron is just uh, responding to an analog single, sig signal. And the, the whole universe is, is analog, right? Everything in around us is just analog wavelengths. 
everything is just analog wave. There's frequencies and vibrations, which is wild. And where let's remap those 69 million neurons and all your senses and your olfactory nerve and your, your auditory nerve and your visual nerves, remap it on a much more advanced uh, senses to allow you to see more of the EMF spectrum, see more of the auditory spectrum, sense magnetic fields, look peer far out into space zip around in your pods at the speed of light, right? Because you could actually do that then. You become fused to a silicon machine. And then you go, well, what about my agency, my communication, my senses, my stimulation? Well, you're in high output mode. You can communicate the speed of light with the machines and with the other people. You can delegate your agency. You can delegate your senses and your agency to a humanoid bot in New York and then zip it over to a bot in on Mars. You don't need to be on Mars. You could literally 20 milliseconds later or the speed of light to the Mars and times like two, you could be anywhere within a speed of light of around 200 milliseconds, which is the latency, which you know, it was just sufficient, right? But you could yourself as a pod zip around at 10% speed of light. So now, right now you can, you think about like walking around here in Singapore and catching a plane to New York is going to cost you 19 hours, right? Because the machine has allowed you to have that agency, which didn't exist 200 years ago, by the way. Mm -hmm. You were limited to like little canoes and boats. And now we've got a, a machine that can take you to New York in 19 hours, mm -hmm. right? What I'm about to tell you, like keep shedding your biological limitations and travel at 10% speed of light. Mm -hmm. that, that is how we stay relevant in the machines. But, and then people go, oh, what is the purpose of the human? What, what is your purpose today? And I've already told you what that is, is to advance human humanity's intelligence genetically and mimetically. And that's still in, entirely relevant as a space brain. Absolutely. It's completely in line, basically. Correct. Next level of evolution. Or maybe right. next, next, next. Correct. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. So a lot of people who are watching that are probably going to think, this guy's on another planet, right? <laughs> no, I'm um, right here with you. But, but <laughs> if we get a bit more, I mean, I understand the whole concept. And if you think about what you said, right, 200 years ago, we couldn't do that. Now we can do that in 19 hours. The next step in whatever, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years is going to be better, right? Yep. It has to, because that's what progress is. If, how old are you? 35. 35. Let's get back to when you were 18. If you met your 18 years old self today, what would you tell him? Upgrade your mimetic understanding universe as fast as possible. Do not, I mean, I was very naive when I was 18. I was, I was trying to, like I said, I was trying to pursue my vision of being an astronaut by like hopping through. Uh, but I was, con no, actually my 18 year old self was pretty switched on. It kind of knew what it was trying to do. It was, it was trying to push towards this. It was trying to ignore the, it was naive, right? It was about the chaos, you know, the distractions of the world and had a singular vision, but I didn't understand why. And so I'd, I'd literally tell that 18 year old person, start producing memes now converting all your time and effort into memes and do it immediately. That's all it is. And genes. I wish I had kids when I was 21. That's a good one. Yeah, honestly, uh, any young Why? person out there, you, your purpose is to upgrade humanity through genes and memes. That's it, genes and memes, baby. So as soon as you can have kids and have a lot of kids and then teach them very rapidly and then spread them out. As soon as they're 18, boost them out, right? And then at the same time, create as many memes as you can. And by the way, you can do all of that and more. You have one daughter, right? One daughter. I wish I had more. Kids you I want as many kids as possible, but my, my wife, my, we started too late, unfortunately. That's actually one of my biggest regrets is not having kids younger, not finding a stable partner and just having kids as young as possible. Just lots of kids. What's your advice for someone who wants to find a stable partner? What's the fastest way to get there if we need to do everything as fast as possible? And this one is a very tricky one, given today's world, right? Dating apps, everybody's very confused on how, how to, you know, there's always like, the, the, the grass is always greener on the other side. There's always a better partner. You talked about the Instagram and all this stuff before, right? Like there's always someone who looks better or is, who seem to have a better life, soon seem to be happier. How does a 21 year old or 25 or 30 year old single, let's say guy, Yep. Find a good spouse as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, I mean, I'm married um, and I took too long to get married for sure. And, you know, there's, 
find someone that you can produce genes and memes with. I mean, just genes with. Uh, you just want a, a partner that that ma matches your imperative about creating kids as fast as possible. And it's you don't need to get too overworked about it. You just need a, someone that's stable, that's roughly the same moral compass. Right, and religion just gives you a moral compass, by the way. Mm -hmm. Religion is a giant meme that gives you a moral compass, as in like allows you to define what is right and wrong. And if you find someone with an overlapping moral compass, generally the similar religion, and that's why religions are useful to humanity and why we've got so far to coordinate, because when we have aligned moral compasses, we, we can coordinate and share resources and evolve faster. And, and so religion is actually useful in the sense that we align our moral compasses. So getting back to it, but religion is still a meme. Everything's a meme. Um, <laughs> it's a wild statement, I know, but... Find someone who has a, has a line moral compass because then you're not at odds with each other as fast as possible. So you've got to match your moral compass and then you've got to match your imperative, right? Your imperative produce genes. You're not with a partner. I mean, you, sh you should have a, a, a productive marriage and have kids. Mm -hmm. that, that's all it is. But even marriage is a meme in that sense. Like what you kind of want is a stable environment around your kids. And a marriage generally gives you a stable environment because you have a aligned moral compass and you have this kind of mutual understanding that you're going to stay together, look after your kids, right? But that's actually, if you peel back the lousy young end, that's all you want is to an environment where you can supercharge your kid with memes, with information as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So they're not worried about where the next meal's coming from or where the threats of the environment. Mm -hmm. You can take away all those, those threats from them and just focus on injecting them with memes for the 18 years. Mm. So generally a marriage, which is a meme, is the best environment for that mm. because it's stable. So find the first, the first partner you can, right, that has a closely aligned moral compass to you, but you first you've got to work out what your moral compass is, right? What's what you will you define as right and wrong. And then try and build a stable environment to produce as many kids as possible and inject them with memes as fast as possible. So they can, and then you because that's your purpose, it's genes and memes. Yeah, that's a long-winded answer, and it's, but it's a difficult problem to solve, that's for sure. Especially if you don't have much money, right? Because let's be honest. Money, money is irrelevant. It, uh, imperative. There's a lot of anxiety for couples today and our generation, or maybe it's just an excuse, but I don't think so. It's an excuse. Saying, it, it, it gives you, you, don't you imperative. Believe. It, like, imperative, having a child will give you imperative. You will solve the money problem. Mm. And money is just a resource problem. Mm. By the way, everyone has time and effort. Money is just stored time and effort. So don't come in and say you don't have much money. No, how much time do you have? How much effort can you produce? Everyone has the same amount of time and a similar amount of effort, right? So the money is irrelevant. Money is just the ability to convert your time and effort into resources to provide stored resources to provide for yourself and the people around you. That's it. And we've all got the same. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? <laughs> too, too short. I, I would kind of think more of five to 10 years. I, I mean, no, nah, it's too short. There's too, too much permutation and chaos in the next 12 months. What's your biggest prediction for the next five years? Look, I mean, Bitcoin will march its way to a million dollars. That's pretty certain. Crypto will 10x. Um, more money will get hotter. Our society will get more chaotic and more confused. I want to try and bring order to the chaos. I mean, I love chaos, right? Chaos tests your adversity and your ability to think fast and, and tests your dynamic environment. Like you should welcome chaos. You should welcome adversity because it proves your intelligence and your agency and your ability to create. That's why I love chaos because like I get to prove my intelligence in the chaotic arena. Absolutely. Right? Great. If you cannot tolerate <laughs> chaos or adversity, who are you? Yeah. You're just a... You're weak. I mean, exactly. it's bad to say, but yeah. it's true. No, it is You're true. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. should look to chaos. Right? You should... <laughs> honestly, because you can... Well, you can you should look to get in the arena to handle chaos, mm. right? You know, it's not about creating chaos for chaos' sake. It's about the universe is chaotic, right? And the universe will throw adversity every single day. It, it tests your intelligence and your agency to be able to navigate that. That's why I'll, I welcome chaos. I welcome adversity. Like throw it at me. I mean, there's a limit, obviously. What is that limit? Yeah. It, it's all solvable. All problems that you can solve. Amazing. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation, JP. That was awesome. Oh, thank you. No, I enjoyed it. It was really good. You asked some wild questions, but <laughs> I mean, I was, there's so much more to talk about. But anyway, whatever. Next time, part two. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Memes and jeans, baby. Memes and jeans. Memes and jeans.